your life. As in your life. Or are you just going to wait for that same thing? Well, I know, but that'll be right. You were the one that said we had to wait. Oh, we like to tell people. Hi, well, welcome to New Life Online. Apparently, we needed to wait a little while for Facebook to get live and to send out notifications. So, hopefully, you haven't just sat watched us talking amongst ourselves. Uh, happy Father's Day! Happy Father's Day to all you great fathers and stepdads out there who have just done the very best all year round and we just want to acknowledge you and say that you are our heroes. Uh, normally what would happen is that we would play you a, a funny video and uh, we'd give you some chocolate if we were all meeting together uh, at church but we can't do that so uh, what we thought we'd do is just well you could watch a video of me eating chocolate. I thought that would work um, really well, well especially for me. Um, so you may have noticed uh, Ruth here and uh, Ruth is just going to, she's, she's kind of our Father's Day video. Um, she's just going to share her story. Uh, of just, it's just an incredible story of what God has done in her life. So uh, I'm just going to pray and then I'm going to hand over to Ruth. Father, would you bless us today as we meet together? Father, would you be with us in our separate homes but still as one church? Father, on Father's Day, would you bless all the dads, would you bless all of the stepdads out there who just do the most incredible job for their children? Father, would you bless them? Would you bless their families? Father, for those that are separated from their loved ones by distance, would you be their peace? Would you be their portion? And Father, I pray that as we meet together, that you would come into each home and touch each life, each life I pray. In the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. So, uh, while I uh, nibble on chocolate, um, I'll hand over to Ruth and uh, she can just share just the most incredible story. So over to you, Ruth. Thanks. Hi. Um, so, thanks, Philip. Uh, most of you will be familiar with me already. Um, I'm the infamous dog sitter that never left. Um, so I've been asked to share a bit about my story today. Um, I'm a bit gutted that I can't stay behind a music stand, but it was going to happen eventually. Um, so a lot of people have seen me uh, usually at the front of church, right in the middle of everyone, laughing and joking, um, but you won't really be aware of the fact that I've actually experienced a lot of anxiety and trauma um, in my life. In fact, if the me of this year had told me of last year where I'd be emotionally, um, I think I would have laughed myself out of the room. Um, I can't believe how far I've come this year. Because last year I was in a really broken place. Um, I'd retreated a lot, I'd build up a lot of walls, um, and I was desperate to keep everyone and everything at arm's length. Um, I'd actually just started trauma counselling, um, I was feeling really broken, and it was awful. I had to face a lot of painful things that I didn't want to look at. Um, I didn't want to admit how bruised or battered I was, or how scared I was of the things that had happened, or how much I'd been let down. Um, so firstly, can I start off? I'd like to take you back to a vision that God gave me when I was about 15. Um, I was like most young women, I was a bit unsure of my place in the world. I was very insecure. Um, there was a lot of scrutiny, body shaming, um, all sorts of things that you get at that age. Um, but God gave me a vision of a little girl dressed up in a princess dress and a tiara and she was being spun around in the air by her dad. Um, but she looks down and she sees that the tiara's fallen on the floor and it's, it's broken, there's jewels missing and she thinks that she can't be a princess anymore because she doesn't have the tiara on. Um, but the dad just picks up the tiara, he puts it on her head. Um, it doesn't make a difference to him because she'll always be his princess uh, regardless of whether her tiara gets broken. Um, at the time, I thought I understood what it meant. Looking back, I had no idea. Um, I think it's fair to say that I now realise how much I believe that my tiara is damaged and can't be fixed. Um, but this year God has chased me down. 
I've desperately wanted to call it quits a few times and leave them way off in the past and they just hasn't let me. Um, you may or may not be familiar with the story of the lost sheep. So in Matthew 18 it says, If a man has a hundred sheep but one of the sheep gets lost, he will leave the other 99 on the hill and go to look for that lost sheep. I tell you the truth, if he finds it, he's happier about that one lost sheep than about all the 99 that were never lost. So this year's really been um, where I've learned that God chases you down no matter what and he always finds the lost sheep. So this year, for one, I ended up in London. I was adamant that I wasn't going to end up in London and I actually applied to the Masters I've just finished um, to prove a point to a lecturer at my undergraduate. Um, didn't think it would go anywhere and I ended up at one of the schools in the top three in the world for public health. Um, but it didn't stop there. A friend of mine from my old church uh, talked to me to visit in the church she'd been at when she was in London doing her Masters. Um, and I eventually agreed to go and it was there that I had a real Jonah moment. Um, over my first few months in London, I had friends at the same church who'd come around me. They found me a counsellor um, and then they insisted that they would then cover the cost of my counselling so that I could start and that money wouldn't be a barrier to that. Um, I wasn't very interested at first. I was adamant that I was doing just fine and I didn't need anybody. Um, well, thank you, you're very own super pastor and his wife. Woo, um, woo. And their ability to challenge you in a way that's unfortunately very hard to ignore. So I came to visit on New Year's Day last okay. year. Yep, for about two days. Um, they randomly popped into my head over Christmas because I'd spent Christmas alone in London because I was working in retail. Um, didn't think anything of it. But God had a plan. Uh, I suddenly found myself telling them my life story, uh, which I didn't really want to tell anyone, but neither of them prompted me it happened. Um, over the next few weeks, Philip was just one of the people who told me that Zephaniah 317 was my verse. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, it says, The Lord your God is with you, the Mighty One will save you. He will rejoice over you, you will rest in his love, he will sing and be joyful about you. Um, I also found myself hearing the song Reckless Love all the time. It drove me nuts. I hated the song. I didn't want to listen to it. But looking back, it actually, it did chase me down just like the lyrics in the song say. Um, for years I've been completely against love. I hated the word love. I wouldn't say it. Um, I didn't want it said around me or about me. Because in my experience, love's disappointing. It hurts um, and it takes advantage of people and it just manipulates people. Um, it's taken a long a long time but I now really enjoy people telling me that I'm loved. I'm enjoying being loved and, and supported through the journey that I'm on. Um, one of the defining moments has actually been a prophetic word that I got while I was at New Life and that's really close to my heart about a colourful map and about how Jesus is the best map reader and it was really a promise that even when I couldn't see the way forward God's the best map reader and he had a plan. Um, it's not been easy to accept that, but uh, I'm learning to trust the map. I'm learning that uh, he's surrounded me with spiritual warriors, parents, uh, friends who are fighting for me through prayer and in love, whether I want them to or not. Um, in ancient Roman times, these soldiers used to have shields that were about five foot tall. Um, and if a man fell, they would basically all come around and they would surround him with their shield around him and above him until he was able to stand on his own feet. Um, this year I've learned that there are a lot of people doing that for me through the rebellion I've felt, the questions I've felt, the anger I've felt, and for quite a lot of the year through the denial that I've felt. Um, which, looking back, is a real blessing, but at the time was really annoying. Um, on, I've had a few very, very difficult weeks. Um, on one of them, I kind of hit breaking point, and I remember standing on Golden Beach and just thinking, God, I don't see how you can, you can win this battle. I, I want to believe that you will, but I just don't believe that you can. Um, I was in a really dark place. I felt really hopeless um, and I felt really isolated. And I felt him really clearly, uh, but softly promised me that he was gonna win the battle for me through the people around me. Um, they were praying for me, they loved me. and he, That was how he was gonna win, it was through people. Um, because they dug their heels in, they put on their armor. Uh, they were wearing their little tin hats and they, they weren't going anywhere with her whether I wanted to push them away or not. Because um, the devil's weapon against me has been that he's, he's really isolated me and 
yeah, I've, I've put up walls everywhere. Um, so God was basically saying that he wasn't going to let that happen and he was going to need people to break those walls down. Um, so that made me think of a passage that wasn't one of my favourites in my teenage years um, from Daniel 10 where an angel appears to Daniel and tells him that his prayers have been answered but there's been a delay because um, the angels have been fighting um, the evil forces of hell and that it's taken about three weeks and other angels have come to defend this angel so that he can come and speak to Daniel um, and that even though there's a delay God's going to answer the, the prayer that Daniel's had. Um, I guess that's kind of been a bit of a solace for me um, over the past year to hold on to that the battle might be long and it might be painful but actually God's already heard my prayer and he's already answered it. Um, I guess a lot of people other people will have experienced that where you have a long journey or a daunting journey um, and sometimes it feels like there's no answer um, and sometimes it's difficult to get an answer and then wait for God to come and do something um, and I've spent a lot of time feeling that way this year but looking back I can actually see that he's using the people around me who love me to win my battle. Um, speaking of, I've had a really great year at New Life Church actually. I've, We're I, the best. No, I really didn't want to come to New Life Church, but I didn't get a choice in it when I was staying with the Amos's. Um, but they've actually been a really important part of me reconnecting with God. Um, I've seen firsthand what it's like to be loved no matter what, without judgment. Um, and to be safe in a church environment where you can really show your emotions, where you can battle with your emotions. Um, it doesn't matter if you stand on the front row and cry, it doesn't matter if you walk out early, it doesn't matter, people just embrace you anyway. Um, and back in November, they did a series, I don't know if you remember, about Joshua and the Israelites going into the Promised Land. Um, and on one week in particular, they talked about memorial stones um, and how they'd placed memori taken memorial stones to remember God leading them to the Promised Land. Um, and I remember sitting thinking, I don't have any memorial stones. Um, I'm being quite surprised and quite disappointed that I didn't have any memorial stones that I could remember. Um, I didn't really see how God could be good. I didn't know why anybody would think that God was good because I thought he was awful. Um, but last month, I got to a year of counselling. Um, Woohoo! Never thought we'd get there. Um, and with a bit of help, I bought some memorial stone plants um, and put them out in the garden. I didn't think that anything would happen with it. Uh, I just thought that it would die. Um, but they've actually gone wild. They're flourishing. Um, and actually it's really nice because they're a daily reminder for me when I sit working from home that there's there's new life coming and there's goodness springing out of the pain I've experienced, um, which is a really nice reminder. Um, so yeah, I've, I've already learned so much on this journey. Um, I still have a long journey ahead of me and a lot of healing to find, but this year God's really chased me down in love. Um, my life this year has just been a tapestry of faithfulness. Um, he's loved me through everything. He's protected me all year, even when it's felt like he hasn't. Um, and I guess the thing that I've, I've really learned and that I wanted to share is that God does heal. He does bring hope and he does protect. Um, no matter where you come from, no matter how much you fight it, um, he's faithful, he never gives up, no matter how much you throw at him or how much you hide from him. Um, so yeah, if you've got any questions or you want to know more, then if you drop the church Facebook or email address, a little note, um, I'm happy to answer where I can or talk to us. Great, great story. The Father's love that uh, never lets us down, never lets go of us and chases after us. Thanks Ruth for doing that. That was a big thing for you. She does actually want to go and hide behind the camera now, but she's actually going to play yeah. uh, the flute for us. So we're just going to, we're going to worship because... Uh, the Father's love is what we're about. The Father's love comes and just rescues us. That's what the sermon is all about. That God has made us alive in him. And Ruth is a living testimony. She is better than a, a video. She is proof that God's love restores. That God's love never lets us go. So uh, we're going to worship. So uh, as normal, just encourage you just to put some words up uh, of how you do. Uh, what God's doing in your life. Of Just response to the worship. Uh, or even in response to, to how God's touched you in what Ruth's said. So I'm gonna, oh, we're going to hand over to the team and uh, we're going to worship while I mop up communion.
voice raised up to accuse you. These benefits are enjoyed by the servants of the Lord. Their vindication will come from me, and I, the Lord, have spoken. And we just thank you, Lord. We thank you that no matter what the enemy brings against us, you work it for our good. No matter what the weapons of destruction, the weapons of lies, the weapons of misconceit, of deceit, no matter what the enemy brings, Lord, you are bigger, you are better. And we stand in your victory because you, the Lord, have spoken and you continue to speak.
So I wonder if you've ever played the uh, what would I do if I won the lottery game. The game goes along like this. You kind of think about all the things that you would do if you won multi-million pounds. So I wonder what we, you would do. Would you, uh, say, buy a big house, a big fancy sports car? Would you take uh, several foreign holidays a year? Uh, my favourite story is of an actual winner who he lived in Scotland and uh, they did the obvious, do you think this will change your life question? I think he'd won something like £132 million. And of course it was going to change his life. But he said, no, no, I don't think it will change my life at all. The only thing that I'm thinking of doing is buying a season ticket for my favourite football team. Which was in fact Barcelona. Which meant that every time Barcelona played football he was going to catch a plane from Scotland to Spain, watch his team, and then fly back, which I just think is brilliant. I wonder what we would do if we heard of a story of a, a lottery winner, who before they won the lottery, they had a poor life, lived in a poor part of town, uh, and despite winning the lottery, nothing ever changed. They carried on living in their rundown house, they carried on eating poorly. They carried on driving their, their beat-up old car and nothing changed despite the fact that they'd won the lottery. I guess most of us would think it was strange that they hadn't adapted to their newfound wealth, their new life. They just carried on with their old life. The Christian life has sometimes been viewed in terms of a before and after, a contrast resulting from God's action in our lives. It's almost like a, a before and after of the lottery win. So instead of us winning the lottery, God comes and rescues us. God's grace comes and radically changes everything about who we are and where we are heading. It changes why we live, how we live, and it may even change where we live. Today we're looking at the second chapter of Ephesians, we're in lockdown life, living free. And for those of you who are into fun facts, for those, uh, for those of you who like uh, words and stuff like that, Paul, the author of the letter, starts the, 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 the chapter and uses 124 words in his first sentence. Now that's some sentence. And what we need to do is to, to break down, if we're going to understand, if we're going to appreciate it, we, we need to break the, these, that 124 down, words down if we're going to appreciate the before and after that we have in God. So that we can see that God coming into our lives is better than winning the lottery. The first thing that Paul says is that we are dead in sin. I wonder if you can remember those kaleidoscope toys that we had as kids. We turned them around slightly and all, all of the colours changed completely. And you only had to make the slightest little change and everything just moved around. And I think that's what... Paul is getting at, he starts with this stark reminder of where we were. He says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. The word for dead in the Greek language here means a corpse or a dead body. <clears throat> Paul is talking about our spiritual state, not our physical state. Paul says that we were in effect alive physically, but dead spiritually. Now, a dead person is, is helpless. They cannot take any action or remedy their situation. They are dead. We say, where there's life, there's hope. Which implies that where there's no life, there's no hope. A corpse cannot revive itself. It cannot bring itself back to life. It has no hope. Death holds people in a very firm grip. Dead Corpses cannot raise themselves. So Paul is in effect saying that we were in a hopeless situation. And that there was nothing that we could do about it to get ourselves out of this situation. We were dead spiritually. We were dead because of all the things that we had done wrong. By the way that we conducted our lives, we were stuck in this dead place. In today's world that we live in, we're accustomed to living in a way where we're required to earn our way. So we, we earn money, 
in order to buy things. We earn money so that we can pay taxes, so that we can have a free national health service. We, uh, if we want to, we can just go out and spend stuff. If we get, say, caught for speeding, we've earned money so we can pay the fine and go free because we've learned the, the power of money. We pay off the fine. We have been accustomed to becoming used to making our own way, as it were, in the physical realm. And I think sometimes we naturally think that we can do that in the spiritual realm. So we have various uh, ways, various methods that we do this. We live a good life. We help little old ladies across the road. We attend church. We help the needy and so on and so forth. These good things, these good works, they comfort us. Because we assume that one day they will uh, translate into a spiritual category which will bribe St Peter when we get to the gates of heaven and that God will let us in. It's interesting when somebody's passed away. If you get talking about that person, somebody will say, well, I'm sure they're looking down on me. Or somebody else will say, well, yeah, they've gone to a better place and one day that we'll join them. Everyone thinks that everyone is going to get into heaven. But Paul doesn't say that. He carries on to say, all of us also lived among them at one time, craving the, 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 gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following the desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by desire deserving wrath. This verse tells us that our benevolent activities, all the wonderful kind things that we do, they're insufficient to change our state, to win God's approval. There is no bribing St. Peter when we get there. No one is born a Christian. Every human being is what the Bible calls a sinner, dead in their wrongdoing from birth. And all of us share that same starting point. All of us have only one way out of this, and that's through the mercy of God to us. This is what the Bible calls salvation. <coughs> Sorry, this is what the Bible calls salvation, which is only available as a gift. It's an outpouring of God's grace and love to each one of us. Salvation is readily available, but it's only because of God's actions. It's nothing that we've done. We cannot accomplish this. So that's our starting point. Paul says we were dead, helpless, far away from any form of hope, not able to do anything to help ourselves. We, all of us, were in this dead place and there was nothing we could do to change that. Now this all sounds very gloomy and before you kind of switch off and go and make yourself a, a cup of tea, there is hope. There is another way. There is a life to be had. Because Paul goes on to say that we were dead in our sins, but God was rich in mercy. Verse 4 says, because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. Paul moves on to explain and explore the way that we're rescued from this dead spiritual state. For Paul... He'd lived this act. He knew by living as a Jew that he had to observe certain rituals. He had to dress in a certain way. He had to eat certain foods. Paul had done it all. Paul thought that he could gain salvation for himself. But he couldn't. Notice, Paul begins by reminding us that even when you were dead, God must act first on our behalf because dead corpses are not capable of reviving themselves. God himself and according to his own purpose and while we were still unaware of him and his love, God made us alive. Paul had his own experience of this when he met Jesus on the Damascus Road. He came to realise the futility of trying to live a perfect life. Paul knew in an instant that he couldn't achieve it for himself. And in that moment, he was overwhelmed by the grace of God. And thankfully for Paul and for you and for I, it makes perfect living unnecessary. And 
The next bit is just mind blown. Even though we were dead, without hope, God stepped in to the very depth of our being and rescued us. While we were undeserving of anything but wrath, God acted in a wealth of divine love and in an abundance of mercy. It has nothing to do with how lovable we were, but everything to do with how incredibly loving God is. <clears throat> Which is why Paul goes on to say, because of his great love for us. The Greek language, probably most of you know this, they have three words to describe love. We just, we just have one. And the words that they have is it's agape, uh, philios, and eros. Now, eros is not used in the New Testament. It's that erotic love. Philios is used to express the affection that one person feels for another. It's the love that kind of God has for us. But agape is a kind of selfless love that focuses on the welfare of the other person rather than one person's own self-interest. And agape love is the love that God loves us with. Agape love is, is much a doing as a feeling word. It requires action. It requires that the person who loves demonstrates his or her love in some practical fashion. This verse is saying that God, God's love prompted him to show mercy to those who hadn't earned it. Because of his great love for us, God couldn't help himself. He had to do something to rescue us and to save us. So after his conversion, after Paul had met God on that Damascus road, Paul realised that his salvation depends wholly on the works of God's grace, rather on Paul's own works. Paul immediately saw that God doesn't uh, measure grace in drips and drabs, but God's abundant grace is sufficient to cover over the most grievous of sins that we commit. God doesn't require that we bow and scrape, but we kind of beg him for grace. But he lavishes it upon us. All we have to do is repent and receive that grace that God has always had for us. And that's why it's a gift. Thankfully, God's grace isn't limited to our, our first offence or our second offence or <coughs> even our third or 77th offence. God's grace covers everything. We should have been punished. We have really, if we're honest, we've messed up in our lives. But Paul knew that God's grace was beyond measure, surpassing all of our own wrongdoing. And in verse 5, Paul declares that you have been saved <clears throat> by grace. In other words, uh, we are totally passive in this, in this salvation. It's God's grace that has accomplished everything for our freedom and our forgiveness. The way Paul uses the Greek language here and its tenses, Paul is saying that this salvation is accomplished in the past, but also remains as a reality in the age to come. This reinforces the sheer enormity of God's mercy and love and grace and kindness, which he has brought to us. Just like Paul we also formerly walked in our trespasses, in our wrongdoing, which meant that we were dead without hope. But God made us alive in Jesus, raised us with him, and sat us in the heavenly realms where Jesus now rules. Interesting, the word repent means to turn around 180 degrees and to walk into a different direction. Just like Paul, we were walking in our dead state to help. But God has turned us around and he's made sure that we're walking towards heaven. He's turned us around 180 degrees. So our path is heaven bound. The moment that a person comes to God, then they move from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light and love that God has where God is. It's all about God and his grace, which is a gift given to us by God. Thankfully for each one of us, God is rich in mercy and extends his mercy to each one of us. And then 
Thirdly and finally, Paul goes on to say that we are alive in Christ. Verse 10 says, we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. In verse 8, Paul says that we were saved by grace. Grace is God's unmerited favour towards us. And as Paul has already explained, it answers the question why we were saved. Remember, it's not about what we've done, it's all about what God has done. The answer is, God has shown us unmerited favour. God, uh, Paul clarifies that God's manner of salvation, the possibility of that, is about all that he's done for us and nothing that we've done. So since our very faith is a gift of God, this gift then makes us God's workmanship. Our salvation, our our lives, show the world that uh, we are a product of God's workmanship. We are, in effect, grace adverts. We are the before and after of a life with God. We are God's workmanship. Now there's two senses to this. First, God created us. He breathed into us his breath of life. And secondly, Through the work of Jesus, God has rescued us and made us new creations. No longer dead, but very much alive. And because we were created in Christ Jesus, we are God's handiwork. With the goal of doing good works. These good works are are vital. God has prepared them ahead of time. Hence these good works are not simply byproducts of our conversion. But they are pre-planned. They are all that God has for us. What happens is that our good works in God, not our own good works, but the good works that God has for us, they display the handiwork of God. They, in effect, show other people how good God is. So while God's primary purpose is to forgive us and make us fit for purpose for his kingdom, he has another purpose as well. Once we've experienced the full measure of his grace, our lives then demonstrate to others the possibility of grace that is readily available for them. Our lives serve as a beacon to other people. They draw them to Jesus. We show that we've experienced grace and that they can experience grace. We should be living lives that show and tell others that they can be saved by God's grace. As Jesus himself said in Matthew 5, let your light shine before me in such a way that they see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. And finally, Paul says that these works were pre-planned before. God prepared them in advance for us to do. The literal translation of that little sentence is that God prepared ahead of time that we should walk in them. The idea here is that God has set things up, has given us opportunities to do good works. Again, they're not our good works that do anything to save us. They are the good works that God has. It's only his grace that's sufficient. But once we've been saved, God expects us to begin to do these good works, to live differently, to behave differently. Living as people with hope, with purpose. Living different lives. So if we endeavour to please God by the works that he has for us, we accomplish those works. When we we do, it's for other people quite often. They're the ones that benefit from the things that we do. Good works kind of are by their nature an outpouring of, of grace, an outpouring of love. They show our faith in Jesus, they show our devotion to him. And we mustn't get mixed up our good works and God's good works. We can't increase God's love for us by doing what we think is good. God just loves us and he can't love us anymore. These good works are hand-picked by God for us. So when, say, you suddenly have a desire to pray for someone, when you suddenly feel moved to go shopping for someone, for those that are in shielding in, in lockdown, 
or when you suddenly feel that you should tell other people about Jesus. These are probably the good works that God has for you, that God has planned in advance for you. Being honest and faithful at work, being an encourager to family and friends, to those around you and countless other things, these are the good works. No, Ruth, you've done it again. There's half a page left to talk about. These are the good works that God has for us. <coughs> so when you feel prompted to do something, it's more likely that it's a good work from God. Prepared before time began. Handpicked by God just for you. Which does two things for me when I think about that. First, it humbles me. That God loves me so much. That God has planned out my life in such detail. Secondly, then I, I, I just want to do it. I just want to do all those works that God has for me. So that I can live a life that is in effect an advert to others. So they too can go from death to life. That they too can live a completely different way. That they too can be set free and live free even in lockdown. So please don't ever think that God has nothing for you to do. As we saw last week, God has not finished with you. He hasn't. We are his handiwork, displaying his glory to those around us. So as we come to the end of our service, we're going to share communion in a moment. As we go into the rest of our week, what next? <clears throat> what kind of, what would we make of a person who lived a poor life in a poor part of town? They ate badly. They drove a beat-up old car, and then they won the lottery, and nothing changed. Now, some people might choose to live in that neighbourhood, but they might choose to use their millions to transfer, transform that neighbourhood. But what happens if they stayed the same after winning the lottery? And it's no different for us. Know this today, that if we've accepted God's grace, if we've accepted that grace, that gift of God, it is better than winning the lottery. God in his grace has saved us. He's forgiven us. He's changed our standing. He has made us alive in Jesus. No more to live as dead people walking around. God has totally changed our circumstances. We are now alive because of Jesus. Our salvation is not a result of anything that we have done, but is strictly a gift from God. So, if you don't know Jesus personally, if you haven't come to that place and asked God for that gift, if you are still, in effect, dead spiritually, you don't have to stay like that. You can become alive because of the grace that God offers you. And it's an offer, like I said, that's better than winning the lottery. It's an offer that means that we can live forever. That we can actually know that we are going to heaven. <clears throat> so that when people look back over our life and say that we're in heaven, we will know for certain that we will be. It's an offer that takes us from spiritual death to spiritual life. <clears throat> it's God's gift. <clears throat> It's grace. So all we have to do is to ask God to forgive us, to allow us to come, allow him to come into our lives and to lead us through life for the rest of our days, to make him Lord and Saviour. So if you've never done that, I just want to quickly pray a prayer. And if you want to go from death to life, if you want to invite God in, if you want to come, come and experience a changed life, then I just encourage you to say this prayer in your own home as I pray it. God, I know that I was dead and separated from you. I'm truly sorry. And now I want to turn away from my past sinful life. Please forgive me and help me to avoid sinning again. I believe that your son Jesus died for me. Was resurrected from the dead and is alive and wants to make me alive too. I invite you Jesus to become Lord of my life. To rule and reign in my heart and in my head. 
from this day forth. Please send your Holy Spirit to help me to obey you and to do your will, those good works for the rest of my life. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you've done that, then God will come and take you from death to life. God will come and transform you. Just to help you to understand a bit more of what I mean, we've released a video. We put it up uh, yesterday evening. And it's Peter's story of the way that God came and transformed him. We're talking about lockdown life, living free. Peter was in prison when he met Jesus. So I encourage you just to look at our Facebook feed. It'll be there somewhere. And just, it's about 10 minutes long, look at Peter's story. Like I said, it's, we're going to finish by just sharing communion together. This is a symbol of, of God's grace to us. Jesus allowed his body to be broken for us. He didn't want us to stay dead any longer. And he came, lived the perfect life so that we could no longer be dead but could be alive in him. His body was broken for us. On the cross, he took an all our own gift. On the cross, he kind of said, God, I'll take their punishment. I'll take their place. He died for us. His blood was shed for us because there was no other way. Our works couldn't cut it. The blood of animals didn't do it. It was only the blood of somebody that led the perfect life that could come and bring our forgiveness, bring our salvation. So we allowed his blood to be shed for us so that we could go from death to life. So let us drink rejoicing in the goodness of God. So we're just going to close with the song. We've run a bit late, sorry about that. But uh, as always, there's reflections up. Every day, just to help us explore this death to life. There'll be stuff up on Facebook and YouTube for the kids uh, and for youth as well. Zoom refreshments will start as soon as we finish the song. Sorry, we're a bit late in that. Uh, God bless you. Know that you've gone through death and you are alive in Jesus.
lives to you, Lord, this week, that, Lord, your will might be done in our lives, that your kingdom might come in our lives, that you'll bring life where there's been death, and that you will revive us and revive our town and our land. Amen.